everybody again and um, thank you for joining us this evening um, again welcome to the supported return to training and um, shielding webinar series um, so tonight's episode is um, called return from shielding finding a path through the bumps in the road so um, it's a pleasure to introduce um, Dr Emma Lishman who's previously run a session with us um, she is a clinical psychologist from the North Bristol Trust um, and she specialises with working um, with junior doctors leading on a supported return to training project and we've got Claire Blount who also works for the North, uh, North Bristol Trust as a clinical psychologist as well. Um, they both work within the staff wellbeing psychology team and um, Claire has been working with consultants and senior um, doctors and leads on the um, consultant wellbeing project. So thank you both for joining us. Um, I know you've been having lots of um, conversations with um, shielding doctors of all um, grades and um, yeah, a, a wide variety of people. Um, so it'd be interesting to um, talk through some of the things that you've experienced and um, some of the challenges that have come up. Over to you. Hi, my name is Emma um, Lishman. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I have um, spoken at a couple of these things now, so some of you may already be familiar um, with myself, so welcome back. Uh, but to new people, um, yeah, I'm a clinical psychologist working in the staff wellbeing team at North Bristol Trust, and I uh, specialise working with junior doctors, um, particularly those who are um, returning from training. Um, and so have become involved in working with doctors who've been shielding uh, through through this role. And my colleague Claire's with me tonight, which is great. Hi. <laughs> yes, um, Emma's invited me along today. It's the first time I've been to one of these, so really pleased to be here. Um, my name's Claire Blount. I'm also a psychologist working in the psychology staff wellbeing team in North Bristol Trust. Um, I have a particular remit um, to support senior doctors in the trust. And I've been doing a bit of work recently for people who've been shielding, um, both doctors and other staff. So this evening we're going to um, talk through uh, a little bit of, of our experience, what we've heard from people who've returned from shielding. Uh, and we've kind of framed that in the kind of good, the bad and the ugly, or we don't like the word ugly, so we're just going to call it awful. Uh, yeah. And then following that, we're going to have a little bit of a think about how people can perhaps navigate some of this stuff that has not, not gone so well for people. Um, and hopefully give some ideas around that. As always, um, please, there'll be an active chat room and please do put questions and things. And I know that Kerry and Amy will um, interrupt us and add in if there's things that feel important as, as we go through. So. We would like to try and make this as interactive as possible. Um, before we start, we just really want to acknowledge that the current context, um, we are so aware of the rising cases. I mean, we're here in the south, um, so we're yet again very fortunate. Um, however, both Claire and I are sat here tonight, there's been some positive cases within our staff working environment today. So we're here this evening with our own anxieties about being at home with our families and um, so just to really try and put it caveat that we know that when we were asked to do this a few weeks ago it was a very different picture to where we are at today and I think we were just talking briefly we knew there was going to be some new guidance around shielding and we've not quite caught up with what what that is or isn't yet but just to kind of acknowledge that we do know there'll be a lot of anxiety at the moment and it's um yeah yeah difficult picture so in terms of uh, experiences returning from shielding, me and Claire have been really privileged and fortunate to speak to lots of people and there has been some really good things that we don't want to be all, all negative. So Claire was going to... Okay, thank you. Yeah, encouragingly, a lot of people returning from shielding have had a really positive experience and we've gathered some of the themes from what we've been told from people, um, largely into sort of two categories. Um, good that the organisation have done to help welcome people back and also people's own thoughts and feelings about being back. Um, several people um, suggested that having a single point of contact whilst they were shielding and working at home was really helpful and really helpful in having that person then help them get back into work. Um, lots of people said that they had really supportive managers, teams, colleagues and departments, which is, was really lovely to hear. Um, um, several people who 
we have had in um, groups, virtual groups online um, to help them, to help people talk about their experiences and share tips and ideas about shielding and getting back into work. People said they found that really helpful. So we're continuing those kind of groups. Um, staff said that on the whole, they were really encouraged by coming back to the hospital and noticing just how different things were from March in terms of how much safer it felt. So people wearing masks and keeping good social distance and all the different processes and um, hand washing that, that was involved that wasn't there when they left in March. People were encouraged by um, being able to come back and progress their training, um, but being able to have a phased report, um, sorry, phased return, so through things like support, and also where necessary, where people have been redeployed or reassigned and, or amendments made to where they're working and all that was super helpful. And we had lots of that feedback from people, which was great. People were really um, enthusiastic about the good um, sort of positive um, feelings that it gave them being back in work. So feeling a bit more normal, having that um, difference between home and work, enjoying seeing patients again, um, enjoying the social aspects of work. In fact, um, one person told me that it almost felt like being in a pub without the drink. So it was just, it was that nice to sort of be around friendly, supportive colleagues again. And also that sense of feeling that they were contributing fully and that sense of purpose. And pretty much everyone we've spoken to has been working really, really hard while shielding, but there was still that sense of being able to be back in the clinical areas and feeling that you're properly in there with your colleagues. Also, people were talking about wanting to keep hold of some of the things that they'd found through shielding. So lots of people had enjoyed having more time with, with family and that it had created sort of sharp focus around values and what matters. So friends, family, being able to be outside when you can and people wanted to keep that going. But also really appreciating having that split now between um, work and home, particularly people who are trying to work at home with children or other caring responsibilities. Lots of funny stories coming in about people doing online um, meetings and having kids playing trumpet in the background or arguing over toys and it was really nice to be able to separate that and enjoy home at home and work at work. Okay so unfortunately it, it hasn't all been good um, and it's a real shame but actually we've also heard a lot of um, really difficult things when people have returned um, and some of this I think is down to people being clumsy, people kind of not thinking, but the impact that can have can be really profound on people. So there's been lots of talks of people having a jolly at home or had a nice holiday or, you know, um, just kind of really um, insensitive comments. Um, people thinking that it was a choice, people not understanding shielding as a process that people were requested to shield, people were giving letters. Uh, sent text reminders it was it was enforced really um coming back and you know the lack of social distancing and particularly this is you know I, I guess from our experiences and probably others things around the canteen and um, more kind of like the social side of work has been quite difficult for people um, and I think one of the biggest things I've heard about is working with juniors is unfortunately shielding ended as new rotation started. It just could not have been worse timing really. So people not going back to where they knew, the teams they knew, the trust they knew. And although I know a lot of work was done on, for a lot of people on trying to help with that, the reality is that people moved and then were with new, new colleagues, which has made it really, really challenging. Uh, the lack of confidentiality, getting back, team members knowing about underlying health conditions, about why people have been shielding. And although a lot of people have acknowledged that that was necessary, it's still really difficult when something that you've kept personal has then been disclosed to the whole team. I guess one of the things that I've heard a lot is around plans changing and not happening. So having a risk assessment, having a plan, it all being laid out and then getting into the work. And really, maybe from nobody's fault. Uh, people have called in sick or things have changed and the expectation is totally different and in that moment that being really difficult to manage. I've heard quite a lot about poor communication 
and also being um, excluded from communication. This is one thing I always find amazing with medicine that emails are sent about people without them being copied into it. So this can really cause them miscommunication if somebody hasn't quite understood something. This kind of like quite paternalistic view where people aren't kind of treated as adults and involved in the communication about what should be happening for them. Uh, and again, that goes into not being involved in plans and discussions. And this has gone on throughout the whole shielding process. Well, I know it's a major frustration for many, many people having mixed and confused, in, uh, confused advice about safety and risk assessment. And this, is, this has been ongoing, we, we're all really aware. Um, and then, uh, so are people's own thoughts and feelings. So, of course, it's um, been really difficult to think about whether to shield again, not always feeling safe, finding it hard to speak up about concerns. And just wearing PPE, although we know we all have to do it, it can make social interaction quite difficult and it can make our jobs pretty hard as well whilst wearing PPE. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Claire. Well, that the thing about PPE, it was something that, you know, as a psychologist, we wear masks, you know, scrubs over on the wards, but haven't had to wear full PPE. And it was something I hadn't properly appreciated until speaking to a, a doctor um, and working as an anaesthetist and just how much of that normal kind of smiling at each other or encouraging each other or a bit of chat to reassure the patients you know as they're as they're going under or that chat with colleagues and just how much that makes your day better and how difficult that is with full PPE I think that's something that so again this is a lot of this isn't you know it's, it's difficult but it's it's nobody's fault but it has made coming back from children um can be can be hard and some of this of course is, is people's faults so the insensitivity and then unfortunately we've had some really really terrible stories and um i, I think there's a few people listening tonight so i'm sure there's some more out there and we are going to ask you in a moment but we've heard of people being sworn out when they've asked someone to do not wear their mask you know under the nose and um, I spoke to somebody who was in the queue and they just asked if the person behind could step back a bit and they just were told to give you that paranoid go home. Uh, there was an awful story about a game of how close um, people could get without the person realising, you know, within the within the two metres. Um, and then just comments, really insensitive comments, you know, back in time for the second wave, we thought you'd have a better time. And of course, there's been some situations where there hasn't been the right PPE, there hasn't been the right mask fitting and the risk assessments haven't been done. So we, we kind of categorised the, the bad from the awful. It's all pretty bad and pretty awful, really, if you're in that situation. But we felt some of it had a malicious tone to it, which was slightly different and I guess one of the things Claire and I were talking about earlier when we put this slide together we were like why would people why would people behave like this it's so poor um, and we're not trying to excuse it because it's terrible but we were just w exploring the fact and wondering about the fact that people are not at the best at the minute we're seeing you know we're, we're so many months into a pandemic and people are anxious people are scared people are frustrated there's a lot of high emotion and so we did wonder whether some of this might be put down to people's situation but if you're on the receiving end that does not make this does not make this any easier but we were really shocked to hear this was going on in our hospitals it just feels that we're meant to be in a caring environment that looks after each other and you know this has has been happening did you want to add anything there claire no, I think that's good. It was just that question, wasn't it, in our mind? What yeah. what makes normally caring, helpful people like <laughs> you know act like this? But it's a very particular, difficult context, isn't it? We're in at the moment. Yeah. So we wanted to hand it over to yourselves listening, and we were just going to ask. Um, I think Amy was going to put the slide up for us um, about your experiences, and I think if we just give Amy my thanks Amy um, and I've put it as quite a long question but it might be good I think it works better if it's in one or two word answers if you could tell us about the good experiences we thought would start first of people coming back from shielding and um, have there been any good experiences I hope so <laughs> one of the things a lot of people have said that when they went off in March and I, well, I say went off lightly they didn't go off when they when they shielded in March mm -hmm. the world was very different and when people came out actually it has felt like hopefully that um 
yeah, being welcomed back, happy to adjust. Yeah. There's a real theme there, isn't there, about that connection with people and that support and friendliness and feeling welcomed that does make us all feel better at work. Yeah. Yeah. Someone's mentioned in the chat as well, supernumerary status. Yeah, fantastic. Um, got good occupational health support which is good to hear um yeah this is good it's it, uh, most of it does sound like it's around other individuals being supported though around either colleagues or um which is just give it a little bit longer adjusted work plan yeah deployment to low risk areas i know that's something they've really tried to do at the trust um we're at got HR being supportive on the chat here as well. Yeah. Okay, good. I mean, we would hope that there was lots of good experiences and that people were supportive. Um, Someone also mentioning, mentioning supportive HR. Yeah. Yeah, my travel of four hours disappeared. That's very... <laughs> Yeah, green zones yes and I guess you know at the start of this it was you know the hospitals had to put all these plans you would hope by now they do have them and have the zones and try and make it as possible as you know possible for people to be as safe as they can be mm, not doing night shifts yeah <laughs> yeah and again it's a big issue isn't it night shifts on calls it's if you've got your plan in the day these things go out the window if you're then on call and i know that a lot of people have felt kind of guilty about coming back but then not doing those parts of the role but again they do introduce more risk for people as it's more unpredictable mm -hmm. although too risky yes yeah, someone's saying too too are risky for me to do on call and night shifts and i think i think that's right it's it's yeah. about individual adjustment and okay Shall we move, Pete, they're still coming in or shall we move on to the... We could always revisit at the end, couldn't we? We can, yeah. Okay, so this is probably the slightly harder bit, but the the not so good experiences, so the, the bad experience or the plain awful. And the reason we wanted to ask this is we, we, we would like to be aware of what people are having to navigate um, before we go forwards in terms of talking about some ideas about how best to perhaps navigate the difficulties. No PPE, gosh. Oh. While we're waiting for them to come in, um, someone's just commented in the question and answer that um, they're a clinical tutor and actually they don't really feel like they had any experience. And I suppose that's part of it, isn't it? It's just such a learning curve for everybody. Um, both shielding doctors and um, people, you know, we've mentioned HR managers, supervisors, all of those things. And I think it was just difficult for everyone with such a, such a new thing, wasn't it? Yeah. No social, poor social distancing, yeah. Mm. Okay, so it mainly does seem to stem around the social distancing mm -hmm. and the um, kind of risk yeah. assessment. Yeah. No contact for several months whilst being off. Isolation, yeah. Yeah. And actually, I, I've had um, working with quite a few doctors now who are back in the hospital, but they're in their own office on their own. There's mm -hmm. still very, very different working to how it was before. So although the redeployment or working in other areas has been useful from a safety point of view actually from an isolation point of view very difficult and a lot of the places that people normally kind of get a bit of relief from have been quite difficult as well haven't they so you know your your coffee areas or your places where people are quite often in a bit closer proximity to you um, makes it just difficult to get that bit of um, almost break time or time away from your clinical kind of place, I suppose. Okay, yeah. I've just noticed in the chat there's um, somebody has said that they found the title of this webinar anxiety provoking because they're still um, working 
I hope, gosh, I've, to, 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 sorry, we've managed to introduce further anxiety. Um, but yes, it's. Um, I, I think there is a reality to talking about people's experience of coming back and how challenging it has been for some people because we need to learn from it and improve things. Um, yeah. Senior managers being unsupportive. Yeah. Incorrect pay, yeah, I've heard that quite a lot as well. And people acting if COVID has ended, yeah, and it, cer it certainly hasn't. I think we had that dip, didn't we, where people were feeling a bit more freer, but I think perhaps this week that might. That isolation, that isolation makes me also think about the person who talked to me about being in full PPE, how even in a room full of people, if you're in full PPE, you feel very isolated, especially if you've been away from work for clinical work for a little while you're feeling perhaps a little more anxious than normal about the, the procedures you're doing and just how difficult it is to check that out with people in that full PPE and that feels isolating. Yeah and again I've just seen like people taking breaks in their car Um, again it's one of the you know we've talked about having the social element of work and if we're not feeling that we can you know do do that element it's yeah gosh being asked for proof of work hours worked home that is that is really poor um oh oh no i was okay so the comment was about whether it was wondering about us getting back to um about us getting back to where we were working in january no that's not that's not our plan <laughs> for this evening uh, it's about yeah definitely about thinking about how to support people navigate this real really difficult time um, like, like you introduced at the beginning emma when we were asked to do this and we were planning it it was when there was a bit more of a lull wasn't it and some people were coming back to work so we were you know the presentation was about that and now it's a lot more unsteady again isn't it with that being much less certain yeah so it does sound like as claire and i feared really please that that there's been equal amount of not so good stuff as as the good stuff and again it does sound like some of that is maybe come from people's um sorry people's naivety and clumsiness and insensitivity but some of it is also incredibly poor and I, i'm just really sorry that anyone's had to go through that having had been shielding at home for all this time to then hopefully get back to work which should have been a positive experience and to have these difficulties um yeah it's, it's saddening and it's um it's maybe even more saddening that i'm not overly surprised but uh, um, so i guess we as i said we wanted to know that what people's experience were so we can try and um tailor this slightly to thinking about how to how to navigate the situation um and so going forward, we wanted want to talk about some possible ideas about what to do if you find yourself in some of these more tricky situations that people have described okay, this slide was um just to demonstrate how our in north bristol trust we've been trying to um really sort of hammer home the idea that keeping safe is everybody's business not just people who've been told they're more vulnerable or people who are coming back to work from shielding so the poster on the left of your screen is being put up around the hospital um just trying to just trying to help people um realize that you know about the different positions people have been in and how important it is for everybody's safety the um flyer on the right we put together around end of july when it was announced that shielding was going to be paused um for people who were felt safe enough to come back in and this we sent out to managers in the hospital to share with their teams about how to best welcome back people into work things that could be helpful things that maybe would be less helpful and a lot of these ideas we um we were given by the people that we were working with to support whilst they were off shielding i appreciate it's teeny tiny writing on here and if anyone would like us to send this um flyer to them we'd be more than happy to do that it would be something helpful but it's just about the idea that it's everybody's business um trying to share that um, responsibility for safety 
And I think that it's, it's difficult that it's often been the people returning from children who have had to do the education and try and get the understanding out there, which is the last thing you want to be doing, I should imagine, when coming, coming back. So we were thinking about what to, how, how to go forward. And we were thinking about so many of the stories I've heard, I've been really surprised to buy because the people who've talked to me about them are some of the possibly most assertive, bright, <laughs> intelligent, confident people that I've met. Often, you know, medics in, in some situations would defend people, their patients, uh, yet have now find themselves in situations where they find it very, very difficult to speak out or to assert their needs or to kind of get what they what they feel is right for them. And Claire and I were talking about what what is happening what is happening that somebody has had their whole risk assessment they've got their plan and then they go in and that plan is blown out of the water because of one reason or another and they go along with it basically feeling unsafe and feeling unsecure or feeling worried about their families and we were kind of talking about what is it as humans that enables us to kind of do this when the thing we really want to do is kind of say no no way so we thought it might be useful to talk a little bit about assertiveness and f for people thinking about how to get what you want and what you need and how to say no but to think about why we might not be assertive as a way of understanding how we can send it up in predicaments which we really really don't want to be in because again as claire said it's everyone's responsibility but then in that moment you end up as the individual feeling responsible for having to assert your needs or saying something isn't right and that can can be incredibly difficult and we felt there was perhaps a number of reasons especially in medicine and the nhs hierarchy why it might be particularly difficult when coming back from shielding to say no or um yeah get get yourself out of a situation which you may find yourself in that you don't want to be in and we, these were impression management the kind of threat power of the hierarchy our own emotions and our internal negative scripts and we just thought we would run through them perhaps as a way of thinking about how while we think about why we can't why we find it hard to do this ways through that might support us i'm bumbling claire is that about right <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of uh, impression management this is hugely important in medicine it's hugely important in training because as we know you've got one long 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 job interview that goes over about 10 years or something <laughs> crazy so um we know that the way people self-present and the way that um they're viewed within teams can carry um a long way and over different placements and that people talk and it's one of the reasons that doctors often worry about confidentiality when when talking to us because they don't want other people knowing perhaps about their concerns or worries and um, so impression management basically involves the process we try and control how other people perceive us and quite often we do this through conformity um, or compliance so what we don't want to do is the one person who's being difficult or the one person who's being awkward and there may be some situations where actually that's a good thing to do and that might be um, make a good impression but quite often if it's you know you're the person who needs to try and get rotor gaps filled or you're the person who's doing something that makes other people's jobs a bit more difficult that doesn't necessarily um, make you feel like you're going to form a good impression and I guess one of the things that throughout the years of my working with trainees has been this idea of a problem trainee which I know everyone's tried to move away from so much but nobody kind of wants to be that person who's who's causing other people a problem um, and I think this can fall into kind of two categories. So in this situation, when we're thinking about how are we um, presenting to others, is, is it safe to speak out? If I speak out in this situation in front of this group of people, is it safe for me to do so? Are they going to listen to me? Are they going to respect me? Are they not going to then go telling somebody else that I've spoke out? But also, is it effective to speak out? So I've heard of a lot of people really being quite apathetic well there's no point in me speaking out because nothing changes or there's no point in me saying anything because nothing happens so why in the cost benefit you might take the risk of speaking out and saying i'm really unhappy about this i'm really unhappy about my team not wearing masks or i'm really unhappy about this situation if you then thought there was going to be an effective response but if you feel unsafe to speak out because people are going to roll their eyes or 
you know, when we talk about safety, we're not talking about, well, we are talking about physical safety here, but also emotional safety. You know, are people going to listen to me, understand me, take on my opinion? You're less likely to do that if it's then not effective because it's a, a double, double whammy. So I definitely think um, this is something that we're definitely hearing a lot of that people just do not feel able to because of the impact it will have on how other people view them. I don't need to add anything to that, Claire. Okay. And then this idea around threat and power. And unfortunately, we work in a very hierarchical system. So threat and power are playing out all of the time. And you can eat, you can have somebody who doesn't, you know, I never feel like a very powerful person, but I know that when I'm with my clients, I have extreme amount of power so quite often it's not that people are trying to be threatening or powerful it's just by the very nature of their position in the hospital the positioning in the training program the positioning in the whole of the system they are so um by being there that can make us feel an immense amount of pressure not to speak out or not to say anything um i think there was an example about um somebody taking off their mask and then everybody else taking off their mask and it was like very interesting to see how if one person of a lot of seniority takes off the mask then other people feel okay to do that um and of course previous experiences if we've had previous experiences as where we have spoke out or said we don't think something's right or we're not happy about something and we've been shot down or it's not going well we're much le less likely to want to do that in the mm -hmm. future uh due to feeling um yeah, threatened and of course we have our own internal threats so I'm not going to go into it because Claire will talk more but our own self-talk and our own kind of integrity and a, a lot of the stuff around moral injury I think has come up during this pandemic because although on one hand we want to keep ourselves safe and our families safe we also want to do our job and be in the hospital and learn and progress and do all those other things so I think this is threatening our sense of who we are and can threaten our sense of self if we don't feel we can be doing what we were what we were trained um, to do. And I guess the final thing that we obviously have to talk about with threat is that the fact we're living through a pandemic, so we are all threatened. And when we're threatened, uh, this picture's maybe a bit tongue in cheek, but it can be like a lobotomy. Like we don't think straight, we don't do well, we are not great when we are under threat because of course, we are focused on the threat, we are hyper vigilant to the danger, everything else is clouded out because of survivally we need to focus on the threat. So we lose our capacity to be reflective, we can lose our capacity to see the wider picture, uh, use all our resources, um, which is why when we're shouted at or something not very nice happens, often we freeze and we stumble and later on we think, oh, I could have said that or I could have done that. But at the moment, that moment, we, um, we, we're not great under threat. So. I think if at the moment you're finding that you're perhaps not as assertive as you normally would be, you're not as um, articulate, you're not managing things as you normally would, this is possibly because we're in this this state. Anything to that? Quote that I can't remember who, who it's by now, I don't know if you can, but that, that quote, no man comes up with a good idea whilst being chased by a tiger, isn't it? It's just that idea that when you're feeling threatened, your field of vision narrows, you know, and, and it's about survival and getting through. It's hard to think, um, you know, it's hard to think more strategically. Yeah. So emotions as well, we're thinking that's, this is another thing that can get in the way of us. Um, being as assertive as we normally would be. Um, one thing that we've heard from a lot of people that have been shielding, um, I think, you know, quite unfairly on themselves, but have been feeling really guilty, especially at the beginning of this um, pandemic, at not being right in the thick of it, being right there in the clinical um, situation, even though people have been working extremely hard at home. There's these feelings of guilt that people talked about when we started to help them um, speak together. Also connected to threat is um, anxiety, anxiety for our own health and others, perhaps um, where, where you're going with career and training. Um, so lots and lots of anxieties around. Perhaps anger, if there's this, um, some of these awful experiences coming back, sort of returning to work and then not being um, valued or um, supported or um, you know, welcome properly by colleagues, so anger can, can show up, definitely. Really tricky emotions, shame, we've noticed um, 
people talking about perhaps in relation to colleagues knowing that they now have a health vulnerability whereas before they didn't see themselves that way and the colleagues certainly didn't know anything about that because it wasn't um, visible. And also Emma's um, talked about it earlier as well, this drive that we've, we've noticed definitely in new medics but lots of professional people, this drive to pursue and achieve and help and um, also at the beginning of the pandemic, I think it was out there just generally in society, that kind of drive to help, you know, what can I do? What can, how can I help? And when that was thwarted for some people by them being told they had to stay at home and they had to shield, I think that's a really uncomfortable um, emotion to sit with as well and alongside these other things. And much like when we were talking about the threat and power, when um, any of us, um, have these difficult strong emotions showing up and they're kind of here in our mind it's really really difficult to do that um, sort of centering ourselves and fact checking and thinking about what we want to say it narrows narrows our vision and then having those strong difficult emotions around can quite easily then tip into Having those, that sort of negative self-talk, that internal negative script. So these are things that people have actually told us when we've spoken to them, that they perhaps felt like, am I being a fraud? Do I really need to shield? Am I, am I vulnerable? I feel okay. Um, I'm being silly asking for this extra PPE or to be in a safe area. Um, looking around thinking others are getting on with it, why can't I? I'm burdening others, so I've um, heard people talking about just that extra, literally talking about a couple of minutes it takes to put on full PPE um, in the middle of a procedure, but feeling really bad about that, sort of delaying um, yeah, surgery and procedures even just for a couple of minutes. Um, worries that I'm making myself look weak, um, worries I'm becoming a problem. Um, and I think when, when all of this is showing up in our head it's incredibly difficult to do that kind of fact checking that thinking you know why am why am i doing this you know why am i in this situation it's really difficult to do that logical thinking when you're being bombarded with your own thoughts like this and i think um, a nice intervention to do with yourself is to first of all catch some of these difficult emotions and um, negative thoughts and just think, would I be saying this to a friend or would I be saying this to a colleague who I also know has been shielding or been in a similar position? You know, what would I be saying to them in this situation? We're often so much harsher to ourselves than we are to, to loved ones. And so it's a, it's, it's a good sort of check in with yourself. But all of this stuff yeah. gets in the way. I think that's probably the thing we'd say the most, isn't it? You know, would, would you talk to a friend like this? And if the answer is no, then we really need to... <laughs> question whether we should be talking to ourselves like it. Absolutely, and we all do it after our, you know, we've, we've checked in with each other, haven't we, Emma, about after decades of psychology, we, we still do it, you know. There's <laughs> no, no easy response. So what happens if we don't get our needs met? What happens, especially in this situation, you know, returning from shielding, we feel unable to assert ourselves for all the reasons that we talked about. What happens if that doesn't happen? Well, there's, um, so a number of responses. Claire, sorry, you're going to talk through this. I've just realised. Okay, you can carry on if you like. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> when we were thinking it through, we were thinking, okay, so what effect does all that stuff we've just talked about have on how you might respond? And the really natural thing to do is to try and defend yourself in some way. And for some people, um, to do with this position and past experiences, that might be, that defence might be attack. So respond with anger um, or just take that anger in and sit with it all day, ruminating about what someone said or what they did. Um, or um, some people's response to defend themselves might be to retreat and back down, sort of get away from that, any sort of conflict. And at its most extreme feeling then that sense of hopelessness or despair or powerlessness um, because of that backing down. So... Yeah, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's right. And I think, you know, this is also, you know, we can look at this in different levels. We can look at this on kind of a societal level and we can see this now, can't we? There's some people who are really angry and they're out there sort of saying the anti-mask groups or whatever they're called, is <laughs> they like very anger people? And then there's lots of people sitting with, and then, you know, I think, 
and then we can see this in our kind of own family levels this applies on applies on all the levels and at the moment it's um you know i think we can certainly say that a lot of us are not getting our needs met at the moment so it's it's no wonder if we're responding in these these ways so these were just just some kind of examples so uh stefan had a clear plan however when he arrived on shift he was told he was needed on another ward he did not feel comfortable about this but he went anyway um, he did his shift but then spent the next four days worrying about his health and this is based about someone I've been chatting to and four days is an underestimate actually was in a real state about um, about COVID and um, following this situation uh, so Sarah's fuming at her team they don't socially distance in the canteen and off to take the masks off when they're in the lift she feels silly saying anything she's like the only one she's thinking of quitting medicine and this is serious I've heard more than one person say they're thinking of walking um, mm. and that's no, it's a real, real shame. Um, carrying these thoughts around all day, it's it's a strain, isn't it? It's a, it's tiring. It's an emotional load, and it can get in the way. You know, we're doing doing our jobs effectively. If we're carrying this stuff all day. Absolutely. And then we've got Joe, who does not know what to do. He keeps the goalposts keep moving. He's recently moved trust and doesn't want to pay a problem, but always feels he's been put in situations which are not safe. And our question is, who wins? who wins in any of these scenarios and the answer is nobody wins the per individual certainly doesn't win but the trust doesn't win the hospital doesn't win the department doesn't win because they're not getting the the best out of people and um, so we were thinking what what is a better response or what is a um yeah what is a more um helpful response than just kind of keeping it in and i'm struggling on so this um so there's various um Kind of assertiveness trainings around and techniques um this is just one idea of an assertiveness script um it, it feels quite basic in a way but i think that can be really helpful at times when we are really really stressed and our thinking's thrown out we need something that um we, we can follow the steps through um it become it this comes from a particular therapeutic approach um sort of aimed at people who've never developed these um, interpersonal skills, this assertiveness. So it is a fairly basic walkthrough, but we, we felt that it is still helpful. Um, psychologists love an acronym. So uh, Linehan was the person who came up with this and she came up with the acronym, I can't say it now, acronym Dear Man. Um, so I'll, I'll walk through those. So the D is describe. So the first thing to do when thinking about being assertive is just describe the facts, try and stick to um, the facts as they are. Um, when I think of this, I particularly think, I think I can be reasonably skillful at work, but at home probably less so. <laughs> so this idea is just stick to the facts in the situation, don't bring up past hurts or um, when you did this last week or you know, just stick to the facts really succinctly in the situation. Express your feelings and own them as, as your your feelings, not you're making me feel, but this situation is making me feel this. And I think that can be a really um, powerful way of um, just trying to get someone on side and not being defensive, but just saying, you know, what the impact it's having on you. And then the A is assert. So be really clear about what you want or say no is the next step. Um, the R is reinforce so within this let the person know um, how it will help if, if they are able to um, give you what you're asking for or the consequences of them not doing that on, on you or the situation as well so kind of reinforce why you're asking or why you're saying no and we'll come up with some um, examples of this in a minute and then the next the M is mindful so being mindful of your emotions and past feelings so if, if you know you're going to go into a situation where you want to ask for something perhaps take a while to just breathe quickly check in with yourself sort of how am i feeling what emotions are showing up what can i do to study myself before i go into this situation um and that that will help you just stick to stick to what you're asking for in the here and now the A is appear confident and um, there's been lots of research that if you can, even if you don't feel it, it's that fake it till you make it kind of idea. Just keep keep a bit of eye contact, shoulders back, stand up, you know, not a threatening posture, but just an open, upright posture. That people do um, listen more, take you more seriously, you're more likely to get what you're asking for. 
and then the N um, is negotiate. So if you're really getting nowhere with asking for what you want, try and um, think about whether you can ask for a little less or, or um, I think what's even better is perhaps say to the person, how can we resolve this or how, how can we how can we problem solve it together? So try and get the person into a problem solving mode. So that's a bit wordy. So, um, so just working through this as an example. So we thought perhaps um, an example that we've heard coming up with people is going into a room and people not wearing their masks. Um, so an example could be, the D could be, the. I'll try and work through in order of these. So you might be saying, um, I've been told I'm more vulnerable if I catch COVID, um, you're not wearing a mask. That's making me feel really quite anxious and worried. Um, I'd really like you to wear your mask. Um, if you, if you do, if it will help me relax into the meeting, I'll be able to uh, um, contribute better. If not, I'm going to be sitting here um, worrying about my health. And to say that in a mindful way, a bit of confidence, and um, perhaps the negotiation could be no nothing negotiation. Really <laughs> <laughs> no if negotiation. Really, if you really need a break from wearing it, perhaps <laughs> step out of the room and we have a break, or stand away from me near the window. Like I think we work through it and it sounds so easy but then I just think of all those things we've just been talking about about oppression management and I'm just thinking uh, it makes me feel yes. sick even thinking of doing it it's kind of like you know what we're asking of people is really really hard and we're really really aware of that because of all the other reasons we we just said but I just think this is so important this is not about you just wanting to have an extra break or wanting to do something uh, you know this is this is important and people need to know how important it is and as psychologists we are working in the NHS um, we're very reluctant to talk about individual responsibility of doing things you know whether that be assertiveness or Oh, um, resilience or anything because it can make very much a problem that's a systemic problem feel like it's an individual problem and I guess what we've got is a bit of a situation here where of course organisation shouldn't have to do this organisation it should be set up that people are wearing masks that you go in you are looked after you are protected you are safe to do your job and um, in a productive effective way this should all be the situation but unfortunately what we've known from our stories and what you've said tonight is it's not always the case and I guess it is really important to have some ideas you know some some things in your backpack you can produce in that moment but we're not saying that this is satisfactory that you should have to think oh I've got to do this but in the moment perhaps having a bit of a plan and me and Claire were perhaps talking about having a few one-liners even I don't know that you can in the moment if you feel unsafe or you feel you've been asked to do something or other people behaving in a way that isn't okay that you are able to assert yourselves because we know how difficult difficult that is just to think that through a little beforehand because in the moment like you say Emma with all with that feeling of threat and the high emotions and the negative going on like this it's really hard to think isn't it so if there's something already prepared or thought about this is this is just one way of um, thinking it through, isn't it, before a situation? But. So when assertiveness doesn't work, or when you don't want to be assertive because it doesn't feel okay, I guess the other tip um, is to find allies. And I guess we do know that talking to others, there's loads of non-patient facing working groups now. There's the stuff that's come out of the, the support and um, hosted by the. Um, so the stag group and spot group there's there's lots of people out there willing to kind of talk about this wanting to talk about this making a difference we heard earlier lots of supported educational supervisors clinical supervisors heads of school and i would also say if there are people listening who are more of the educators and those people really making sure finding out what's going on for people because quite often it's it's not fair to us the person who's in the situation to be the one who speaks out and sorts it there should be other other people helping with that and of course there are either the PSW or the P, um, PSU depending on where you are and the deanery support and the BMA but I think the bottom line is we cannot be putting up with 
things that make us unsafe at work. We've had years and years of health and safety, safety executive and um, you know, we all go through all our fire training and our information, you know, there's so much stuff that's meant to keep us safe at work and this is a real in the moment issue and it is not acceptable for people not to feel safe to do their jobs and if if it doesn't feel okay for you to speak out which i fully understand because when me and claire were planning this it felt like that was you know could be done and it was only then i was like actually in the, in the moment this would be really really challenging i think to do i don't know how safe i would feel to do it and i work in a lovely team but i still feel a bit awkward saying oh can we all do something differently i think um so if it may be that the best thing is to get other people get allies get other people to support and what we know as humans is what best helps um temper anxiety is is connectedness to other people and i think that really showed up in the kind of what was good about people's return to work it was a lot about that wasn't it about having those relationships allies friendly faces and that's absolutely what calms all of us yeah. as humans yeah so for those of you who are, i guess there were some comments earlier perhaps who are still working from home or working in different roles this may be something to think about before returning who who are those people who are those allies who are those supports and having those people in place and again i really acknowledge that's that's difficult with the transient nature of training and the moving around it might, might be harder to think about who those people are but having people that you can yeah speak to and support you and um yeah be on your side with with this and we we show this this is a uh, um, one of the slides that was developed by one of our colleagues, Olivia, and I think we just use it at everything because this, you know, we're trying to move so away from the original ideas that, you know, we can all just get more resilient, more well, more strong, more assertive. Actually, what we know is that people do well, have these supportive connections, processes, teams that are safe. And if we can foster these, then everybody can do their job better and, and be more well as well. Um, do you want That's making me think, Emma, as well as just, and I don't know how possible this is, but getting senior allies is really, really important. Mm -hmm. But just um, how powerful it's been getting people who have been shielding together in kind of, you know, virtual online groups and just people being able to share experiences and stories and find strengths from each other to challenge things that they're seeing that aren't right or, you know, get ideas about where to go with that. That's been really powerful. So so i guess our kind of take home messages um would be that we you know nobody chose the situation nobody wanted the pandemic nobody wanted to have to shield and nobody then wanted to have to return to environments which which didn't feel safe as far as we're concerned everyone we spoke to shield has been working really really hard and if they haven't been working hard that's not because of want of trying they've been asking but the work's not been forthcoming. In fact, most people I know have been overcompensating and working really, really hard at home. Um, our safety, your safety and well-being is as important as that as our patients. It's not a good system if we're prioritising um, one person's health over another. All of our health is really, really important. And your health and safety and well-being at this moment is of paramount importance. Um, to notice and challenge on our own critical thoughts. Sometimes, you know, we can be in really supportive teams and everything can be going well. And actually this is an internal process of us giving ourselves a hard time or thinking we should be doing better or could be doing better. So just checking in what, what we're telling ourselves. Um, finding allies to keep contact with, people to support us and to, and to help us. Uh, talking to others, um, I'm sure many of you listening are, are connected and if not, I'm, there are ways of building those connections. There's a great um, peer support network out there now. And of course, we always like to talk about how can you build in rest and well-being into, into your life, into your working life. You know, I think a lot of people come back from shielding have been a bit reluctant to ask for leave, but you know, have leave, have breaks. Um, I'm really sorry to hear that people are sitting having breaks in their cars. It's, it, it's just, yeah, it's really, really difficult so I guess maybe thinking about that is there anybody you can meet up with and have have even a virtual lunch break it's not the same is it but or going for a walk but trying to find ways over these next few months of keeping and uh, because I know we call it socially distancing but actually you know it's physically distancing and keeping socially relating to people and being being supportive and there's anything you want to add there Claire 
You know, look, I just thought of um, something else we, we could add just from a conversation I've had with somebody who has, well, a few people that have come back from children. It made, made me think of it when you said about overcompensating at home and doing lots and lots of work. And I think people have been. But then people have also talked about feeling like they need to do that once they get back into the clinical situation. So feeling they have to be the one to volunteer to do that extra bit of work or go and do that extra thing because their colleagues have been working clinically for a long time. And we've had conversations about just trying to catch that and pace it because this is a marathon, not a sprint, isn't it? Okay, so I think, thank you for sticking with us and listening to us. We've, I was made aware last night we're clashing with the Bake Off, so if anyone's still here, that's there. <laughs> we're doing okay, but um, I don't know, we've not been keeping an eye on, Claire and I have not been keeping an eye on the chat, so I don't know if there are any questions or any comments or anything we people want us to talk to or anybody else on the panel. Um, there's not really many direct questions, um, but I just invited people to kind of um, make any comments as well or kind of share what what they've kind of experienced. Um, there's some people mentioning that it can be quite difficult to approach situations where their, um, you know, their line manager or their supervisor is giving them certain advice or expecting them to um, want to uh, come back. Um, in particular, someone has talked about an experience of being told, um, you know, maybe don't involve occupational health because they'll advise you to continue to shield or, you know, you, you may, if you're continuing to shield, um, it might affect your pay or your progression and all of those things and actually feeling in that um, quite vulnerable situation. Have you got any advice? I know that's quite individual but I think some people are experiencing that that you know there may be one person in there in a number of contacts that um has a viewpoint like that or is comparing them to other people in different circumstances that may have returned from um shielding or being a a, a different high risk group and has come back or partially come back um I think there has been, I've be heard a bit of that the comparison my my advice would be first to sit down and figure out what what it is you want and um, i use want loosely because i know this isn't what people want but given the situation what is the, what's the non-negotiables what what is okay and what isn't okay and because sometimes it's either way around some people are wanting to come back and people are saying no so it's you know e either way and um, it what what is acceptable for me what's acceptable for my family what 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 do i want and then then going into those discussions with a real strict kind of bottom line it's really unhelpful comparing to other people because we're all individuals and everything's going to be different and I guess using the thing that Claire the um the acronym that Claire talked through again that would be very much describing the fact well this is my situation this is what my consultant has said to me um you know I guess I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that you feel that other people have done it but maybe their situation is slightly different to mine and I guess yeah it's it's having that bottom line isn't it it's so challenging though when people are in the hierarchy and not being supportive it's incredibly different and so, I they get support i mean you get support in these situations that's such an upsetting um thing to hear isn't it is that a really direct example of what you're talking about Emma, about that kind of threat and power i mean that's um we weren't thinking about it in such direct terms even were we when we put that together no. And I, I've seen some stuff coming up around like being people being threatened not to get paid and um, you know and, and we've you know, we've got to be realistic haven't we? I mean people are entitled to be paid of course they're, they're working and um, there will be some people for which I guess this will impact on training progression uh, inevitably and I guess that is a discussion but that shouldn't be used in a threat based thing that should be a how you know given this the fact that you're not able to do this part of the job at the moment that may you know we've got the new outcomes now from the lcp and so i guess it's about problem solving if this is going to go on for a little while which it looks it got are there other things are there other competencies are there other things people can be doing um but that needs to be in a supportive context not in a threatening if you don't do this this isn't going to happen um, and if that is happening that's that's not acceptable and i i would think that needs raising um, even though I know it's really, really hard to raise it. Um, 
the trouble is that this is a covid is bringing out cracks and showing them further i think and um there's already some cracks in some of these systems and this is maybe you know the the person who's saying that probably is not a very supportive person anyway and yeah I don't I think, think it's a very helpful answer. The answer is we don't know. It's totally unacceptable, though. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not totally you for sure. deciding on your your kind of line, Emma, and you know, just getting back to those values about. And I think that's what a lot of people did get in touch with those values really early on when that anxiety was you know through the roof back in sort of March, April, and it was things about your own health and the health of your family, and yeah, just just thinking through you know what what is the most important thing here, isn't it? And then absolutely contacting occupational health, I would have thought, in that situation. I think it's easy to feel alone or feel like you're the only person in that situation as well when that happens to you. But actually, you know, we've heard from so many people in situations like that or having difficult conversations with one person. Um, and that's why I think some of the some of the network and some of talking about these things is really important because you're you're never the only person um there's there's lots and it's it's easy to feel um like like you're the only one in that situation when i i don't think that's the case yeah definitely i, I noticed there was a comment about reasons for extension for training as well and I, I i wouldn't want to answer directly but i think certainly you know if you've not been able to do the things you would do to, to be able to do you know i've spoke to a couple of people who are actually quite happy to have training extended or yeah um but definitely speak to your es about that um and it, it, and to be fair to the educational supervisors this is new for a lot of them too and i think a lot of them are wanting to do the best but they're also not always sure what to advise but if not do speak to you know the, the people at the deanery the local support teams because there is um there is provision for this now like i say those arcp outcomes and i guess everyone's just learning but it, it may be that there is a reality that there, there does need to be an extension and of course if you've missed out on training then you then you may want you may want the opportunity to catch up or um so yeah do do raise that and speak to people don't feel uh, yeah i mean all i can just keep saying is please speak out and i know it's really really hard to speak out but quite often when we do speak out we find that actually somebody else wanted to raise the question or somebody just hadn't thought of it or person's like oh gosh i had absolutely no idea i mean i know that doesn't always work out like that but i think it's so worth trying speaking out um it's making me really worry for um and other colleagues perhaps in the hospitals as well you know people that perhaps have got even less power than you know training doctors you know the the, the domestics or hcas or you know i wonder what kind of experiences they're having in their situations kind of coming back from this just in relation to some of those um kind of questions about uh, progression and things we've got um dr antonia calagaris who um is in the background um helping us answer some of the questions online um i think you would like to make a little comment right <laughs> yes thank you and um, thanks so much and thanks so much to claire and emma for a fantastic session so far um, and to everyone for joining but i just wanted to come back primarily on the question around um, if your line manager isn't supportive and i would absolutely endorse what has been said already and particularly emphasize that as trainees you also have what whilst the whole issue around shielding is regarded as an employment issue so sits very much with the employer and the employer's occupational health department as trainees you also have the support of the deanery and i would really emphasize um, your support return to training team at your deanery are um, tasked with supporting shielding trainees um, and i would go to them if you're finding it difficult to um, despite using the fantastic assertiveness tools that you've been talked talk to about today, um, if you're finding it difficult, because it is very hard when it's your line manager, um, it's a complex sort of power situation, whereas people in the support program are there to support you and they can often, they won't necessarily solve it for you, but they will have um, local knowledge about ways of dealing with this sort of situation and they may not be aware that these things are going on in individual trusts so i would really really urge you in addition to the things that you've been uh, recommended to do already to to access the, the deanery support program yeah. um, and 
I haven't really got anything to add about the progression because that is very, very much an individual thing. Um, everyone's situation is slightly different and it sits within the school, your particular school within your local office. Um, and so if you want to have discussions around that, and certainly the trainee was saying, would it be reasonable to have an extension? Um, the only people really who can uh, support you with that are your training program director and your head of school. Um, that isn't ultimately their decision, but they advise, uh, make, make recommendations. And so they'd be good people to talk to if you're in that situation. And it equally works the other way because there are some people who have almost been forced to have extensions slightly against their will because as has been commented already sometimes um really valuable stuff that you've been doing while you've been shielding has been overlooked um so as long as you have evidence for what you've been doing um argue the case with your training program director and head of school uh, about things like that so i just wanted to add those few points to yeah, it and, I think, and, and, it. and also i do think actually well, part of being assertive is asserting when we need some help with this stuff and speaking out and when to ask for it that's a really important part of you know being able to sort of say actually this i don't i can't know everything about this but somebody else can help me and and use that support because the support teams are they're so knowledgeable about um about this area so it's well worth getting in touch okay. There are um, a few comments as well, just for those that are in kind of adapted roles or continuing to be at home um, and, um, you know, working from home, etc. Um, in different in different ways, according to what that they, what they're able to with their individual circumstances um, and just kind of a those feelings of guilt and difficulty and also the circumstances being so different so for example you know if being expected to um, work the same hours but not necessarily with the same um, structure or support and also you know particularly if we go um, back into a bit of time when when everyone was in lockdown those um, extra commitments of looking after you know children other people being at home being in a very different environment and just feeling like actually you're overworked and you're trying to do even more to compensate for the fact that you're not in a not in a hospital environment um, can be really really difficult to kind of manage. I think it's also important not to underestimate just um, just how much energy it takes, like holding all these anxieties and all these different aspects as well. You know, it's an extra layer of, of you know what, what people are dealing with on top of trying to work and trying to negotiate that maybe at home or in a different environment it, it's tiring it's exhausting I, I, I don't know what what we can say about the guilt because it just keeps keeps coming through just such guilty beings uh, you know there's nothing to feel guilty for this was not you didn't ask for this you did not want this you I'm sure you would change it in a moment if you could you know if you could get rid of the underlying health condition you could get rid of your child's underlying health condition you know if we could get rid of covid you know but this is the situation we find ourselves in so going back to what claire said earlier just really watching how we talk to ourselves all the research shows that the way we talk to ourselves the way we respond to ourselves is is as impactful as if we were living with somebody who was talking to us like that if we lived with a bully we would expect that we would emotionally struggle yet we can bully ourselves we can talk to ourselves in this way so really trying to to watch that and i know i know it's challenging and we don't don't have all the answers for that but i think if people are really struggling that with self-criticism with guilt and it's it's tipping over into something that's causing a lot of problems which it way melt way um it may well be doing by now all these months so please again do seek support there there is the bma are offering free support there's support for and um, professional is it hhp as well there's there's lots of support and then there's support through local deaneries and stuff as well so you know don't suffer in silence with this um it's a real normal human reaction to feel this but it it is you know we're just having really normal reactions to abnormal situations so just looking after ourselves and sharing this and i'm sure once you share it people will kind of try and try and talk you out of it but yeah it's I, I know it's difficult um yeah it's a it's a really difficult time uh -uh. um i'll just point out a few things as well um 
there um, is a link in the chat to the HEE um, digital resources website for supported return to training. Um, so then obviously not um, relevant to everyone, they're aimed at kind of um, trainees that are under Health Education England, but a lot of the principles and a lot of the sessions are really generic and um, quite helpful. So there's a set of um, clin clinical refreshers um, and a few wellbeing um, webinars from a few months ago, um, but they're all re very relevant if you are um, wanting to just update yourself on something before returning or doing something different or going into a different environment. So we recognise that actually all specialties are very different, all individuals are very different and even though we've been talking about um, returning and the bumps in the road, people are at very different stages of that and they will be for a long time and things are likely to change so we know there's still so much uncertainty around. Um, so please do have a look at those if they're useful. The other shielding webinars are also available um, on that website. Um, so uh, Emma's previously done a talk um, about the kind of experiences of shielding doctors and how to kind of adjust to um, what's happened and I think people have found that really really helpful so thank you Emma um, and there's also a set of um, very generic podcasts um, on some of the kind of um, non-clinical skills so human factors um, some commentary from the professional support and well-being team and some um, trainees about their experiences during COVID-19 etc so hopefully you can find some useful information there um, if you look on the HEE supported return to training national site, so um, if you just Google that or we'll post it in the chat, um, you will find contacts for all of the regional offices. Um, so if you haven't already accessed supported return to training um, and you're a trainee in England, that, that will be quite useful. And even if you're not, you can find um, links to um, some of the HEE guidance, which again, some of the general principles might, might be helpful for you or um, apply, apply to you or point you in the right direction. Um, so definitely worthwhile having a little look there. Um, I don't know, there's no other comments in the chat. Emma or Claire, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about or bring up? No, just thanks for joining us and good luck. <laughs> like keep keep supporting each other, keep yeah, speaking out and yeah, use those resources that Kelly just highlighted, I guess. And thanks for joining us this evening. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much both. It's uh it's really great to to have you um, and thanks for all the preparation that you've um, that you've put into the session today.